Hey YouTube family, what's up you guys? I hope that you guys have been watching my podcast interviews. I have been posting them on here just for you. And today, you guys, y'all are going to be in for a treat. I First of all, before I even get into the treat, can we just appreciate this room? Like, this is my new podcast studio and my husband worked so hard to get this set up for me. I'm so grateful for him. But look at these walls. Like, is this not the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? So I I just, I wish I could give you a little tour. Um, so over here is, this is my favorite thing too. Like if you guys go back and watch some of my other videos, you'll see that I usually do them in front of this like gray barn door that I have in my bedroom that I love. So I was like, how can we kind of recreate the barn door feel? And so this is what we came up with. This is actually just wallpaper, y'all. And so anyway... Love that. And then over here, you can't see, but I've got like my um, sound panels. And actually, let me see if y'all can see this. If I shift the camera. Okay. We're... Do I look like I'm sitting on a toilet? I was on a Zoom call and my friend said, are you on a bathroom? I was like, what? And she was like, you look like you're in a bathroom. After I just got so excited about my podcast studio. Do I look like I'm in a bathroom to you guys? Comment below and let me know. Who has this in their bathroom? Tell me. Do I like I'm in a bathroom? Okay, where are we going? All right, so y'all see, like, okay, this is my microphone. And this, okay, I just have to show you this. I'm so excited, you guys. All right, so this is my beautiful boom arm and my, like, microphone. So I feel so legit now. But these are my soundproof panels because this is a smaller room. And you guys... Y'all might not know anything about like sound proofing rooms and I've learned so much about all of this stuff that like I never knew, honestly didn't want to know, but because I do videos and because I do podcasts, I need to know about it. And so um, I've learned all this stuff and so um, I found out that if you are recording in a smaller room in order to not have reverb, which is echo, you need to have all this like soundproofing stuff. So we have all kinds of, I can't show you the whole room, but there's like all kinds of gadgets and gadgets in here. So anyway, I just wanted to showcase that to you. So from now on, you're going to always see me doing videos here. And sometimes I'll be outside when the weather warms up a little bit. But for now, we are in this beautiful new space that still smells so, <clears throat> just smells great. If you've ever done like new construction like you've ever built a house you know that um there's like that new construction smell that's exactly what it smells like in here so i hope you can appreciate it as much as i do but i want to kind of preface this um video today because i'm so excited like i try not to fangirl too much um and i've had some amazing guests on this podcast like you know we've had some some folks that i'm like why did you say yes <laughs> But thank you that you said yes. Um, and Sheila Ray Gregoire is one of those. I've been following her for a lot, a lot of years, about seven years, eight years, something like that. Um, and she has a podcast called To Love, Honor, and Vacuum. And so if you've never checked her out, go to tolovehonorandvacuum.com after you watch this video. Um, and you'll be able to find everything about what she does. But y'all, I'm telling you, like this woman drop some bombs on us today, you're going to be like, I need to actually right now go ahead and like and save this video because you're going to forget about it in six months, but I need you to come back to it because she just gives us so much value here. So without any further ado, um, Sheila is an international speaker. She's an author of nine books. She's got a new book coming out in March of 2021 um, called The Great Sex Rescue. And so what we're talking about today is all about sex. We're talking about marital consent. Um, that's a really big topic um, that is it really deserves a lot more attention than what it's getting. We talk about marital rape. Some of y'all have never heard of that term. I honestly don't really use that term a lot. Um, and so we're going to talk about what that is. How do you know if you're experiencing that in your marriage? We're going to talk about how to build better connection. What what makes a good orgasm? I mean, y'all, it's like all in here. I cannot wait for you to listen to this. So here we go. You're going to love it. Comment below with your favorite things about this podcast. Comment below with, you know, some things that you found out maybe that you didn't know about. Maybe some questions if you have any questions. I do go back into these comments. I delete the crazy ones, but I do come back in and I will respond to all of your comments. So do comment below. Let's get into today's podcast or podcast, I should say. Here we go. 
Well, Sheila, again, thank you so much for agreeing to do this podcast today. I'm super excited to talk to you. Um, like I was kind of telling you in the intro, I've been following your blog since 2013. And um, I, when I thought about doing this series called All About Sex, I thought I've got to talk to Sheila. Like, I feel like you've been doing this for so long and you've written books. Of course, you talk about sex and marriage on your blog. And I love how you kind of have this, um, this real like interesting blend of like really real and like relevant but also like holy you know um and I feel like that's kind of what's missing in the church I feel like sometimes the church can kind of go to the extreme of like let's only be holy let's only talk about like the practicalities of sex but the fact that you are like no sex is great it can be fun it can be exciting and so I just I love I just love everything you do and I'm just super excited to have you here today well, that's awesome. We are going to have some fun. Oh, yes. yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. I can't wait. I can't wait. Um, so let me just ask you just out the gate, your blog is called To Love, Honor, and Vacuum. So what mm-hmm. is the vacuum part? Like what made you come up with that title? Well, actually, I, I'm hoping to rebrand this year because what happened was when I started writing my very first book in 2003 was called To Love, Honor, and Vacuum When You Feel More Like a Maid Than a Wife and a Mother. Mm. And it made sense. I was writing about marriage and parenting and housework and all of this stuff. And then I started my blog in 2008 and I thought that was a cute title. So I went with that and I was writing about marriage and parenting and housework and just a typical mommy blog. And then I started to notice that every time I wrote about sex, my traffic increased. And (laughs) and my husband and I do a lot of speaking at marriage conferences and we always do the sex talk because nobody else wants to do it. And I'll talk about anything. I don't care. I'm good with that. And he's a doctor, so he doesn't care. And so we were always talking about sex. And eventually um, I actually published a book, uh, the, um, the Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex in 2012. And I became this Christian sex person. And so my blog has really morphed over the years. So um, we, we changed the name of our podcast this year to Bear Marriage. So yes, we're, I we're saw the that. Podcast. And I'm hoping eventually we just have issues with Google, but eventually we'll be the Bear Marriage blog too. So mm-hmm. awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I saw, I was like, oh, that's so good. Like bear, obviously like naked and, you know, mm-hmm. do you find that because one of my favorite scriptures, I always reflect on the scripture in Genesis where the Bible says that God created Adam and Eve and they were naked and unashamed. And mm-hmm. I started really just diving into like, what does that what does that mean? Um, And I feel like so often in marriage, like even in Christian marriages, there's still so much shame surrounding sex. Mm -hmm. And um, especially, you know, with, with women who have been taught um, that sex is wrong and it's, it's, it's bad. And, and, and it is, Mm -hmm. we believe as believers, right. That it is not out. Sex is not intended for um, to be outside of marriage. I'm sorry. I have something in my eye and I'm like, what is going on? (laughs) Anyway. um, (laughs) However, I feel that it is difficult for a lot of women to then make that shift once they get married to then sex being this beautiful, wonderful thing. And so I was speaking to a couple on the on last week's podcast, the Lawrences, about why they feel like there's still so much shame and stigma surrounding sex in the church. Can you just kind of give us like a real quick, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, there's a whole lot of reasons. I think that there there is a lot of shame because we just don't talk about it enough. And when we do talk about it, it tends to be focused at teenagers and our message tends to be don't do it. Mm -hmm. And we've equated purity with virginity. Mm. So we say, you know, stay pure until you're married, which implies that as soon as you're married, you're no longer pure. Right. So we need to stop saying that because purity has nothing to do with virginity. I like to say that, that our purity is based on what Jesus did with his body, not what we do with ours, you know? So, so our, our purity comes from Christ and purity encompasses so much more than just the sexual realm. You know, do you gossip? Are you greedy? <laughs> do you lie? Like, like purity is our state of being before God. And so obviously we want a biblical sexual ethic where sex is for marriage. But the way that we put so much more emphasis on virginity rather than any of these other things really makes sex seem like something ugly. Like when she gets married and, and, and she has sex, she's lost something. Yeah. Even if she's done it in marriage, she has now lost this precious treasure that she had to give to her husband. It's now gone. And that was so much for her identity. 
And so I really hope that we can change the way we talk to youth groups too. Um, and besides the whole question of what does that say to sexual assault survivors, right? Yes. Like, and that's a whole other issue. Right. But when we say that purity is about virginity, what are we saying to those who have been assaulted? So yes, I right. really, yeah, I think that's a, yeah, that's mm -hmm. such a great point. And so I, I, oh, no, no, I was going to say, yeah, like, so I, oh, go ahead. <laughs> You go, you go, you go. You go. <laughs> I was going to say like in your book, um, A Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex, you talk about the difference between like a good girl and a bad girl, right? And I think that mm -hmm. so many women have been told that even if like, yeah, of course, if you're a sexual assault survivor, but even if you've chosen to have sex outside of marriage, like mm -hmm. my husband and I, he's my only person, but we, um, we had sex before we got married. And I grew up in the church, you know, in the purity culture. And so definitely feeling like damaged goods. Um, and so mm -hmm. what do you say to women who have obviously like had sex or maybe right now they're listening mm -hmm. to this podcast and they're struggling with their, with their sexuality, they're struggling to, to, um, to not have sex, but they're feeling like mm -hmm. they're, they're some kind of bad girl. They're feeling some sort of, um, like they're damaged. How, how does a woman make that transition from feeling like a bad girl to now a good girl? Yeah. So a good girl is not someone who did everything right. You know, a good girl is someone who just knows Jesus and is embracing God's view of sex. That's mm -hmm. all a good girl is. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what you did in the past. But I think one of the problems we have is that we forget why God wanted us to wait for marriage. We see it as like this arbitrary rule. And so when you pass that, that line and when you do something wrong, God is now going to punish you. But I think we need to get back to what is God's heart here. Mm -hmm. And the reason that God put sex in marriage is because God has a protective heart. He just wanted to protect us. And if you look, especially back in ancient civilizations, when all of this got started, women and children were really vulnerable. And so keeping sex in marriage guaranteed that children would be born into a stable relationship and that women, even after they gave birth, and even once they were aged, would have, would have care. You know, they, they would not be left out on the street. So there, there's a protective thing. It's to, you know, it's to make sure the disease doesn't flourish. It's to make sure that the family is the basis of society so that there's some stability. You know, it's to make sure that when we do have sex, it's in a, it's in a committed relationship so that sex becomes more than physical. So that it, it's about relationship and it's about intimacy and so that we can understand real passion and real intimacy. And I think if we understand the reasons, you know, that it is about protection for us, it's about protection for our hearts, then it's not so much that God is angry at us and that we need to punish ourselves if we've done wrong. Mm -hmm. It's instead to say, okay, you know, my life has not been ideal. <laughs> you know, I, I may have done some things that God wished I hadn't done, yeah. but in Jesus, everything is new and God is not punishing me. <laughs> This is what I want people to understand because I talked to so many married women um, in the surveys that I, that I initially did for the Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex. You know, only about 40% of women who, who were evangelical, who believed were virgins on their wedding night. Mm. And so many of them said that they felt like God was punishing them because yeah. they can't reach orgasm anymore. They can't get aroused anymore. Sex doesn't feel that great. And it's like, no, hun, God is not punishing you. You're punishing yourself. Yeah. And don't punish yourself for something that God has already dealt with on the cross. That's you know, so weird. Let's yeah, get back so to the heart good. of Jesus in this. That's right. I love how you bring out like the heart, the why. And, you know, I have four kids and um, they're 11 to 21. And so trying to teach them about healthy sexuality and anything, not even just sex, but any rule. I'm always telling them, I was having a conversation with my 11 year old last night about why does mom and dad discipline you? And, you know, I was telling mm -hmm. him, it's not because we want to punish you. It's not because we want you to feel bad. It's not because we don't want you to have mm -hmm. fun. Uh, we, we happen to be talking about why I'm so strict with sugar. Okay. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I monitor heavily what my kids eat. And I told him, you know, my kids are all athletic, so they're not like, there's not a weight issue, but it's just, um, this, 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 I know what sugar can do in excess. And so um, mm -hmm. we were having this whole conversation about that. And, and I was telling him, and as I was speaking to him, I don't know, like if you, when you've spoken to your children when they were little, like you hear God, like echoing, speaking to you. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's exactly what the Lord was saying is that like, when I tell you a no, it's not to limit your fun. It's not to hurt you. It's because I know the dangers of what's on the other side of that. 
And so as mm-hmm. a child, if we can trust our good, good father, like he says no for a reason. He says no because he knows that sex outside of marriage um, is, is mm-hmm. detrimental. And, you mm-hmm. know, when I'm talking to groups, um, a lot of times I'll, I'll give them the analogy of the fireplace. And I'm like, you know, if you're in a living room and you've got a, a beautiful fire going in a fireplace, it's great. You hear the crackle, it's cozy. You can put s'mores on it, whatever, right? It's, it's great. But if that mm-hmm. same fire is then now in your, on your rug, it is no longer beautiful mm-hmm. and cozy and warm. It's now dangerous and deadly and, and it destroys. And so I feel like mm-hmm. if people understood that part, um, it would be a lot easier to maintain their sexual um, integrity for lack of a better mm-hmm. word. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I know that, you know, you've been married for a while and correct me if I'm wrong, but you got married kind of later. Is that right? No, I was actually quite, quite young. I was 21. Okay. Okay. So we've been married for 30 years, almost, almost not quite. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Cause I was like on your blog, it says 25 years and I'm trying to, put, like, I know I haven't like, updated that in a while. I got to update that. Yeah. yeah. I got you. I got you. One of the questions that I get all the time, and I'm really excited to be doing this next series. I'm going to be talking to singles because I think one of the questions that I get a lot from singles is like, how do I still like date and then not go, obviously not go too far, but like, I have desires, I have needs, mm-hmm. especially for those who have mm-hmm. already had sex. How do I maintain this? Um, how do I maintain my sexual integrity if I'm in a relationship? So how do you counsel single women, mm-hmm. especially who are, who are struggling with that? I think again, we need to get back to the why and we need to realize like rules are not going to do it. Yeah. Like it, it, rules never motivate anybody. It needs to be a heart decision. And I'll tell you that one thing that I have found is that there's different levels of emotional connection. Okay. There's different levels of communication when we talk. So we can talk in cliches, like how was your day today? You know, it was nice. It was fine. You know, we can, we can share facts, like what happened today. We can share our opinions about politics, about anything. But sharing feelings and sharing our fears and our deepest needs, that's highly vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And most couples exist at like that third level where you're comfortable sharing opinions and we share lots of facts, but opening up about your feelings, about your fears, about your needs, that's a little bit more difficult. And what we found is that at the point where you start having sex, you often, it often becomes harder to get to those deeper levels of communication. Because what happens is that sexual intimacy replaces other forms of intimacy. So you, because of the bonding hormone, because of oxytocin, you feel close. You feel like we're really intimate. Like we're, we're totally close. We're totally bonded. Everything is great, but you may not have actually gone further and really understood each other's fears, needs, like that's when you really figure out who a person is. Right. And a lot of people get married before they've gone to those deeper levels of communication because sexual intimacy has replaced that. And then once you're married, it's actually more difficult to get to those deeper levels. So what I recommend to couples is just focus on emotional intimacy. You know, And that of course is gonna fuel sexual desire because yeah. it does. <laughs> But, but really focus at talking, figure out what makes each other tick. What are your fears? What are your dreams? What are your needs? What are, what are the most difficult things that's happened to you? What are the best things that have happened to you? You know, really focus on that stuff before you're married. And remember, you know, we often think, um, I'm going to wait for marriage for sex so that I'd never have to wait again. Mm. And that's the attitude going into marriage. Like, isn't this amazing? Once I'm married, I'm never going to have to wait again. Marriage doesn't work that way. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like once you get married, there's still going to be periods of drought. There's still going to be periods where you got to exercise some self-control. There's going to be work trips. There's going to be postpartum issues. Right. There's going to be depression. There's going to be grief. There's going to be illnesses. There's going to be stuff. And, and so learning self-control and learning how to love each other, even when you're not connecting is such an important gift. And it puts you on a real solid footing when you do get married. 
I love that. Oh, focus on the emotional connection. Yes, yes, yes. You know, I came across a stat the other day that kind of blew my mind. And I know that porn, we talk about porn a lot when it deals with men, but I realize that a lot of women are, are dealing with porn. Um, there's mm-hmm. a, a stat on psychology today that said 35% of all pornography users are female and then covenant mm-hmm. eyes. Um, they actually published a report that said 15% of Christian women look at porn every week. Mm-hmm. And so again, that's another thing, whether you're single, whether you're married, a lot of married women feel like they have to watch porn because Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, curiosity or technique. Um, And so I know that porn destroys marriages. Um, I've seen it, you know, and and Mm -hmm. I've talked to many people who've had their marriages destroyed through porn. How can a Christian woman, and again, this podcast isn't just for Christians, but the majority of my listeners are believers or Mm -hmm. Christian friendly, as I like to say, how can Christian women or women in general who are wanting to know like some techniques, how can I be better in the bedroom? Like, where do you point them if they want to learn? Like, we don't want them watching porn, but like, what can Mm -hmm. they do to develop some better techniques in the bedroom? You don't need technique. You just need communication. I think people need to understand this. If we can just get the communication part down, we'll figure yeah. stuff out. Yeah. Like you really will. The more you're able to communicate with your husband, the more you're able to get vulnerable, the more you're able to have fun, you're going to figure this stuff out. Now, I, I do have a lot of things on tech techniques um, on my blog. I've got a great book called 31 Days to Great Sex, which is a challenge that you and your husband can do together. You just read two to four pages a night and do what it says. And I want to point out that it's 31 Days to um, two great sex, not 31 days of great sex. Okay. So I'm not saying, I am not saying you have to have sex for 31 Every days. Every single great. day. No, no. A lot of the, a lot of the exercises are on how to be more affectionate, how to flirt more, how to talk about your baggage, how to talk about what you want. And then of course, how to spice things up and things like that, but also how to handle our porn issues, you know, how to confront that, how to stop it, et cetera. So it's a really fun challenge to do. Um, but I, I, I want to say to the porn users too, again, we often frame porn as a sin and it is a sin, Mm -hmm. but I think the best message and the most empowering message, if people really want to quit is not only to see it as a sin, but to primarily see it as a vehicle for sex trafficking. Because when we understand that when you watch porn, chances are you are watching somebody being abused in a violent, degrading way. Very little porn is consensual. Mm -hmm. Even the porn that says it's consensual, often um, the women are really drugged up Mm -hmm. or they were victims of such tremendous sexual assault in their past that, you know, it's just, it's, it's just not clear how much you can really consent. And porn is the biggest fueler of, of sex trafficking worldwide. And so when you participate in porn, you are participating in something which enslaves people in the most degrading, awful way that we can imagine. Oh yeah, that's such a great point. And I think if we can just pray that Jesus will will give us his vision of what pornography is, Mm -hmm. so that if you ever get tempted to look at it, that you will see those people on the screen through Jesus's eyes, Mm -hmm. and you will understand what is being done and what you are contributing to, I think a lot of us would have an easier time switching the screen off. No, that's such a great point. And I don't know if a lot of people know that, you know, I, um, I think that people just think, oh, well, these are two people they're they're getting paid for this, you know, I'm just going to kind of watch what Mm -hmm. they do. So thank you so much for bringing that out. Um, so you said we don't need technique necessarily. It's all about communication. And I love that you said that because every couple is different. Like what works in your marriage, Sheila, might not work in my yeah. marriage. I might not like what you like, you know, and vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, trying to kind of model your, your marriage off of what the, the latest Cosmo magazine techniques are, um, mm-hmm. is probably not going to be as beneficial as just having a conversation with your spouse and saying, I like this, or I don't like this. And that's one mm-hmm. thing that going back to your point about vulnerability, that I don't feel like a lot of women especially um, have been empowered to do is to say like, I like this, or this feels good. I love it when you do that. It's like, I don't know if I'm going to say anything about that, you know? And so I love that, that you're encouraging women like, no, like you have to take responsibility for your sexuality as well. And if there's stuff that's going on in your marriage bed that you don't like, or you're bored, because like some women are just bored you know, Mm -hmm. Um, and they don't feel like they can say anything. So 
can you give us some tips? Like, do you recommend in the moment? Do you recommend before sex, after sex? Like when should these conversations be taking place? Well, can I back up just a minute and then I'll answer that yes, question? Absolutely. Okay. I, I think one of the biggest problems that you that you touched on is that women feel really uncomfortable talking about the stuff. But the reason that women feel uncomfortable about it is often actually has to do with our definition of sex. So let me give you an example. If okay. I were to ask you, did you have sex last night? And I'm not going to ask you that. Don't worry. Okay. Oh, I will <laughs> tell you. I had sex this morning. <laughs> okay. Well, there you go. But but chances are you're picturing something specific that I'm asking. Like you're picturing, I am asking, did he put his penis into your vagina and move around until he climaxed? Yeah. Okay. That tends to be our definition of sex. Mm -hmm. All right. Now I have just finished a survey of 20,000 women. Um, and it, the, it's coming out in our new book, the great sex rescue, which launches in March is an awesome book looking at how different evangelical teachings have impacted women's um, sexual and, and marital satisfaction and how we can get back to what the Bible really says and, and God's real vision. Cause there's a lot of shame messages going on, Absolutely. like we've been talking about. So mm -hmm. awesome book, great sex rescue. But what we found is that the majority of women do not reach orgasm through intercourse alone. Mm -hmm. Most women who reach orgasm do it through other means or through a lot of foreplay and then intercourse. Mm -hmm. And only 48% of women reach orgasm almost always or always compared to 95% of men. So we have a 47 point orgasm gap. Wow. Okay. So that's a problem. Yeah. And I think that part of it stems from our definition of sex, because if we think that sex is penis in vagina until he climaxes, then her experience isn't even included in mm -hmm. our definition of sex. Mm -hmm. And so then couples get married and they have sex and she doesn't feel much of anything. And so she feels I must be broken. Wow. Because this doesn't feel that good for me. Yeah. And he feels that she must be broken because why doesn't she like sex? And so she feels like I am substandard. I'm not working. My body isn't working. And maybe he tries a bit of foreplay. Maybe he touches something. It doesn't do much for her. She doesn't know why it doesn't do much for her. And so they just keep having sex for years, even decades where it has never felt good for her. Mm -hmm. And the reason you see our, our definition of sex is not actually biblical sex. Man puts penis into vagina and moves around till he climaxes. What that is, is one-sided intercourse. Yeah. And intercourse is certainly a part of sex, but it's not the whole thing. Mm -hmm. The biblical definition of sex is a mutually pleasurable experience that is also intimate. <laughs> so, you know, Genesis 4 verse 1, Adam knew his wife Eve. It's that word for intimacy that God uses. Sex is not just physical. Excellent. But also throughout the scripture, it's very clear that sex is supposed to be mutual. So I would define sex as any sexual activity that you do, which is mutually pleasurable, which is fun, where you feel intimate together. And that should be our sexual relationship. And that means that if she needs something other than intercourse to orgasm, she is not being selfish. That's right. Say and that she is not broken. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's she good. She's not selfish and she is not broken if she mm -hmm. needs something other than intercourse. Mm -hmm. And as a couple, you need to figure out how to talk about this and how to realize my pleasure matters too. It isn't an afterthought. It isn't a bonus. It isn't an extra. Mm -hmm. It is integral to the whole thing. Yes. Oh my gosh. Love, 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 love. I think that if women did realize that, you know, then there would, that, that just that knowledge alone, it uh, removes that, that shame. It removes that stigma. Mm -hmm. It removes the uncomfortability of like, am I, am I asking for too much? Because that's, mm -hmm. I believe what we've been taught, you know, it's so interesting that you say that the Bible teaches about sex being this mutually beneficial experience. And I think that that is going to be like heresy, you know, to so many <laughs> of us who were raised in the church who were like, we didn't know that, you know, mm -hmm. um, I was talking again on, on my previous podcast about how I grew up feeling that, um, the woman was just there to serve the man's needs. And that wasn't necessarily mm -hmm. always explicitly said, but that's what I saw. That's and in all the Christian couples that were around me. It seemed like mm -hmm. the man was like, he was the, the, he was it, you know, he was the king. And as the woman, you're mm -hmm. kind of there to like help him out and to meet his needs. I even did hear a teaching that the word help meet was you were only there to be his sexual help meet. And I was like, wow, mm -hmm. you know, and this yeah. is what's being taught. Mm -hmm. 
And so um, I want to talk a little bit, Sheila, you have a, a, a statement on your blog that I thought was so funny. You said that you've been married for, well, at the time, 25 yeah. years, happily married for 21. So I know obviously yeah. those numbers have changed a little bit yeah. But yeah. without like getting super personal. I mean, you can be a trans- transparent as you want, but like, what were some of the issues in the four years there when you got married? Because mm-hmm. it seems like you did things the right way. You got married young, you were a believer. Like, what do you think were some of the the... Um, disadvantages, I guess, that you had getting married that made that that made there be so much struggle in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Well, the biggest one was when we first got married. I had vaginismus, which was, and a lot of women don't even know that word. And so yeah. we need to learn this. We all know what erectile dysfunction is, right? Right. right. You know, but we don't know what the equivalent is for women. Like we know what sexual dysfunction is for men. We don't even realize women can have it. And so when women go through, they they think they're alone. And vaginismus is sexual pain. It's when the vaginal muscles contract to make penetration really painful or impossible. Mm -hmm. And and when we got married, I had this and nobody knew what this was at the time. And everyone thought it was in my head, like I was some abuse victim and I was really messed up or I was rejecting my husband and I was sent to psychiatrists, which is exactly the wrong thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you need to send these women to pelvic floor physiotherapists. It's a physical issue and it can get better. Um, but this was a huge issue for us because we had done everything right. And then we got married and sex was difficult. And I felt like my husband didn't understand, like he, he wanted to have sex anyway, even though it was painful for me. And so it's like, you only feel loved if I'm in pain Mm. and that doesn't compute. And then he just didn't feel it. It was, it was a really difficult couple of years for us to, to sort that out. And that's why one of the things that we really looked at in the great sex rescue was what causes sexual pain, because Christian women have sexual pain at twice the rate of the general population. Wow. Wow. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when we looked at it, what we found is that a lot of the messages that we are taught actually really increase our rates of sexual pain. One of them is um, uh, you are obligated to have sex when your husband wants it. Mm-hmm. You know, Christian women are often taught that. And that has the same effect on sexual pain, the same statistical effect as being abused does. Wow. So you can imagine how much abuse victims might suffer from something like this. Sure. Well, women who grow feeling like I am obligated to give him sex when he wants it, have the same rate of sexual pain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let me so ask we just question. need to find a better way to talk about it, you know? Yeah. Let me ask you a follow-up question to that because I did an episode called Maintenance Sex and it was basically mm-hmm. how sometimes you, you will have sex when you don't always want to. And I think mm-hmm. that there is a difference between feeling obligated, like, oh, like this is a chore. I mm-hmm. don't want to. Maybe you're on your cycle or maybe you um, are in pain or maybe you just, for whatever reason, don't want to. How, how, what is the difference between obligation and then un- what I feel like is unconditional love where you give, even though you don't always mm-hmm. want to give? An obligation is something where you don't have a choice. Gotcha. To give, even when you don't particularly feel like it, is a gift. Yeah. And that is a choice you're making. And the problem is that a lot of a lot of our Christian resources phrase it in such a way that you don't have a choice. Gotcha. There is no option to say no. Like your body and is I, not your own. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a that's a very damaging and traumatic message for women to hear. We need to be able to make a choice. And, you know, um, in the great sex rescue, we looked at uh, all the Christian bestsellers for marriage and sex, and we rated them on a number of um, key indicators of healthy sexual teaching. And then we looked at a secular control book, the best-selling secular marriage book, which was John Gottman's seven principles for making marriage work. Mm -hmm. And of all the books we looked at, only John Gottman's book, only the secular book even talked about the issue of consent in marriage. Wow. Many of our Christian marriage books actually had anecdotes of marital rape, but didn't call them that or else they did. And they dismissed them as not important. And so this is the kind of thing that I'm fighting really hard against because I believe in great sex so much. I think that it's such a passionate thing that God gave to us, but we need to give better messages to women, Yeah, you know, like sex, sex is an intimate sharing of yourself. Yeah, It's not, it's not sex is a deep knowing it is not an owing. There's a huge difference. I love that. And and we and and when we need to get back to God's vision for what passion is yeah. and for what intimacy is, 
instead of seeing it as just an entitlement for him so that he gets his release. Cause that's a very shallow, toxic way of seeing sex. And I think that's why a lot of women have problems with sex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about marital rape? Because I don't think a lot of women are familiar with that. We know what marital and we know what rape is, but putting the two together, Mm -hmm. like how would a woman know that she's a victim of marital rape? How would she even realize that that's what's going on in her marriage? Yeah. Cause we tend to think of rape as something which is only physical, like he's holding you down. And so it's like a violent thing. And it certainly can be that. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I've had lots of letters from women saying like, he just won't take no for an answer. I curl up in a ball and cry. And he just has his way with me anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, things like that. But there's also things like um, if, if by having sex with him, he stops beating you, you know, that's rape. If by having sex with him, he's nicer to you or he stops yelling at the children as much, Mm. you know, that's, that's rape. If by having sex with you, he gives you more money to go spend on groceries and allows you access to finances, that's rape. Mm. Like if there's anything which makes you not be able to truly consent, because here's the thing, if you can't truly say no, then you also can't truly say yes. That's right. In order to be able to say yes, you have to also be able to say no, or else your yes isn't really a yes. Yeah. And so anything that makes it impossible for you to say no means you're not also saying yes. And so if you find yourself in any of those things, I would just advise that you call a sexual assault or domestic violence hotline and just talk to someone and say, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this qualifies as abuse. I know that I'm not comfortable with it, but maybe, and I don't know what the word for what I'm going through is, but but, you know, can you tell me if, if this is okay or not? Yeah, that's so good. And I think also having a conversation with the husband, obviously, if it's a, if it's a situation where if a woman is in danger, for sure, get help immediately. But I think mm-hmm. sometimes that men have also been raised with a lot of these damaging beliefs. And a lot mm-hmm. of men have been taught, like, you, you have the right to do this. You know, once you get married, your wife mm-hmm. is basically at your back and call. So I think men also need this message of like, it is not your right to demand sex all the time. Mm -hmm. Like you and Mm -hmm. my husband and I, we are always talking about equality because that is not something that again has been really taught in the church a lot. Um, And so you have the whole like submission theology, which is fine. But I think that that can get a little off the rails a little bit, especially Mm -hmm. concerning sex. Like you have to just submit at all times. And so thank you so much for, um, for just talking about that marital rape piece, because I think that a lot of women are going to hear this and be like, I had no idea that this is what I'm experiencing. I thought that this is okay. Mm -hmm. I thought that this was what I was supposed to do. So thanks Mm -hmm. for that. Um, I'm thinking about women and not just older women, but women who have had children or women who have maybe had a surgery or some sort, something has happened to their body and they no longer look like they did when they were 21 years old. (laughs) So how do you help women with confidence issues? I feel like we see so much, whether it's in the, on TV or in magazines and like these beautiful photo, obviously we know that they're Photoshopped women, right? We know that in our heads, but we still see that visual. And so so it can really damage our confidence. How can women help themselves to be more confident? Because I find that the, if I feel confident, I'm going to show up better in the bedroom. Yeah. So how can we help women to actually develop more confidence with their bodies and their marriage? Yeah. I think one of the biggest thing is to focus on health and not beauty. Good. Like our, our, our impetus for losing weight or all of those things that we were, but needs, needs to not be so that I look good. It needs to be so that I have energy, you know, so that I feel good so that I am healthy and I'm able to live out God's purposes for my life so that I'm able to live a big life like that. That should be our impetus, not beauty because beauty is not our standard. And then I think we need to remember our bodies change. You know, like after you've pushed out three kids, you're never going to be able to sneeze in the same way again, right? Like our bodies change. Forget the trampoline. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) And if you have a lot of problems with that, see a pelvic floor physiotherapist. But anyway, like our bodies really do change and that's okay. And we're going to have stretch marks. And those are like, those are like our battle wounds. You know, those are, those are trophies to show, Hey, 
I pushed out a baby, you know, <laughs> or I, I, at least I carried this, this baby and I gave it life. And that's an incredible thing. And you are going to change, you know, our metabolisms are going to slow. Even if you're in amazing shape, you're not going to look the same at 50 as you did at 20. Right. And, and that is all right. But what you can do is you can still dress with confidence. I think that's such a huge issue is a lot of women, the way that we dress reflects how we see ourselves. Mm -hmm. And when you dress in oversized t-shirts, when you're really, when you dress in daddy, you know, we're in the middle of COVID and so many people have just given up everything because, right. Hey, I can just wear yoga pants all day. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with yoga pants, but like put in a little bit of effort sometimes because when you dress differently, you feel differently. You present yourself differently. You stand up straighter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you have no idea what to wear, if you have no idea how to do your makeup, find a friend who dresses amazing and ask them because they want to help you. They, they really do. They have been Every woman, <laughs> yes, every woman who dresses well would love to make her friends over, but you can't just say to someone, hey, can I make you over? <laughs> you <Right. know? laughs> so just ask a friend, they will go to the thrift store with you and they will put like eight outfits together that look amazing on you yes. and you will have the best day. So, you know, try some of those things and cause it's okay. It's okay to dress your body. Well, no matter what your body looks like, it's not like you're only allowed to have good clothes and you're only allowed to wear makeup. If you, if you're a certain size, mm -hmm. no, you can mm -hmm. dress your body. Well, no matter what size your body is, and it will help you feel more confident. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila. This has been so fun. I feel like, you know, you have like that girlfriend kind of vibe, like, Hey, let's just sit down and have coffee and, and let's just talk about this. So thank you so much for just everything that you've given to, um, to marriages for so many years. I'm excited about your book coming out. I will link to that in the show notes, um, to your website, of course. And, um, and thank you for doing that survey. I think when you can, when you can poll 20,000 women, um, and ask questions, you're going to get some really valuable information, obviously. Yeah, so yeah. I'm just, I'm just grateful for um, just our conversation today. And just, of course, everything that, that you've, that you've shared. So thanks so much for being on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Absolutely. <laughs>